Why are so many Christians sick? Well, I have a partial answer. Hi, I'm David Servant, and this is Heavenward TV. Well, thank you so much for joining me once again, and God bless you as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. Today, we're winding down the book of James, and we're in a sort of a controversial passage here now, this passage about uh, divine healing, and it's in the Bible. I know that some have just brushed it off and said, well, those people back in those days believed that there was efficacy in oil for healing and so forth, and that really takes a shot at the inspiration of the scripture and at the apostle James, and so I certainly am not gonna adopt that viewpoint. I think James chapter five and verse 14, 15, and 16 are uh, applicable to us today. I think they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, and I don't think they should be neglected. I think they should be looked at and examined closely. So that's what we're doing here uh, together. All right, now, uh, last time we were together, I was talking about reasons that people, Christians, might be sick. And I don't want to leave the impression that I think that every Christian who's sick has some kind of sin in their lives that they need to confess. And nothing's more obnoxious than Job's friends who are always giving you the reason why you're sick. You know, poor Job, the reason he was sick is because he was such a good man. He was so holy. So he didn't really fit into what I was talking about last time, did he? But you can be sure that he examined himself. Sure he did. And he questioned the Lord. Well, you know, what's going on here? I've been serving you as best I can, and this is what I get for. You know, he was totally uh, mystified by his sufferings and, and uh, wasn't until the end where God even began speaking to him about it and still didn't even really give him much insight, not as much as you, we have who have read the book of Job. Anyways, that's a different story. Uh, but anyways, I do not think that every Christian who is ill or suffering some kind of sickness or disease has got to have some kind of hidden sin. And it's not our place to judge that, but it is our place to teach the Word, and the Word of God makes it very clear that, sure enough, I mean, it's worth examining ourselves over. Sins of the tongue, we talked about that last time. Well, another reason, if we push genetics aside, okay, the things that you know people might have because of hereditary reasons, and I'm not claiming to be the expert on all that. I'm kind of a balance of skepticism and science, you know, and, um, you know, but, but let's just push off the table what I confess I know nothing about, okay? Uh, and I know something about the Bible, and I know that certainly, you know, sickness can be an indication of God's discipline in our lives, and we can there's a remedy for that. Well, you confess your sin and repent. We've been talking about that. Another reason that people uh, are ill within the body of Christ and outside the body of Christ is because, you know, they're abusing their bodies. I mean, everybody's pretty much got it figured out nowadays that uh, smoking tobacco, for example, increases your chances of lung cancer. And most everybody knows that by overeating and indulging ourselves in junk foods and uh, gaining a lot of weight is not good for your health and you could open yourself up to you know uh, type 2 diabetes and so no you know if you if, if over the last 20 years of your life you gained 100 pounds and you got type 2 diabetes well you know you're not going to say that's hereditary you know well my parents had this i bet your parents you know maybe ate the same way you ate you know so I think that a lot of the sickness within the body of Christ has to do with the fact that we're not really treating our bodies like the temple of the Holy Spirit that they are, but just like the tobacco smoker and so forth, we're putting things into our body, compounds that were not intended to be there and certainly not intended to be there to the degree and the quantities that we put in there because God does have means of detoxifying our body. Our body's always trying to get rid of the bad stuff, right? You know, uh, every time you go to the bathroom, your body is trying to get rid of the bad stuff. And uh, your liver, uh, 24 hours a day, all your life is cleansing blood and getting stuff out of there and, you know, dumping bile into the small intestine to get it out of there. And when you sweat and so forth, you can help detoxify that way. And so if you're overloading your body with stuff that, you know, body was never intended to take in those quantities, well, you know, you're setting yourself up to be sick. And so all the prayer in the world isn't going to change anything if you just keep on poisoning yourself and toxifying yourself and, and hurting yourself, right? Right. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is a touchy subject. Uh, I, aren't you glad that I can't see you? Because I want you to know I'm not 
talking only to you. Don't feel like, oh, he's picking on me. I can't even see you. I'm looking at a camera for goodness sake right now, okay? I don't know who you are, but if the shoe fits, maybe you should try it on and see if uh, you could get a little wisdom from this guy that really loves you. Okay, and God loves you. He's not against you, okay? I've actually written recently a couple of e-teachings on this very subject. Um, you can find them on our website, uh, and there's our website address for our teaching website. Uh, one's titled, Lord, comma, Bless This Poison, and it's all about nutrition. From, from a biblical standpoint, I've actually got Bible verses in that teaching. And another one that I recently wrote is titled, um, uh, oh, a, a lot of profit from a little exercise. A lot of profit from a little exercise. So you, if you type either one of those titles into our website search bar there, you'll come up to, the, come up to those e-teachings, and there's a lot of interesting information there. And I'm going to be writing some more in the next few months as I work on that. And, and it'll help you. I talk about, you know, uh, fasting and how that can be a means of helping you to get healthier. And that's biblical, right? There's over 70 references to fasting in the New Testament. Right? Sure. And the Bible does have st something to say about what we put in our bodies. Had a lot to say under the Old Covenant. I'm not saying we're bound by any of those laws under the Old Covenant, except those ones that have carried over into the New Covenant. All right? For all the dietary laws, I'm not a believer that we have to follow those dietary laws. But I wonder what the reason was that God gave Israel those dietary laws. Did it have anything to do with their health and their greater good through what they'd eat? That's a subject of debate. But Paul told Timothy, use a little wine. No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. That's dietary advice. Daniel and his three friends refused to eat the king's choice food, ate, uh, you know, vegetables mostly and, and water, and their appearance improved dramatically after the test, and, and they kept on eating and kept on looking better and performing better. So, you know, and God is the one who created food, right? Right, so he knows what goes best in our bodies. All right, well, we'll get into James uh, in our next time together. I'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the last seven verses of James chapter five, the end of James. In a, passage that uh, is somewhat controversial, but it shouldn't be controversial. It's just in the Bible, and it's pretty uh, obvious what James is saying. Is anyone among you sick? Now, who? Who? Anyone among you sick? So listen up if you, you know, you're sick. Let him call for the elders of the church. Great. Let them pray over him. Great anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So three-step process. Call the elders, then they pray over the sick person, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. Three steps. Does that guarantee that the person's gonna be healed? No, no. Verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And uh, it's not an original idea for James, right? How many times did Jesus say to people whom he healed, your faith has healed you? indicating had they not had faith, they would not have been healed. Can we just all just put up our hands and say, amen, brother David, that's the Bible truth? Because that's, that's irrefutable. And uh, had they not had faith, they, not, they would not have been healed, even though it was God's will for them to be healed, as plainly proven by the fact that they ultimately were healed because they had faith. And that's irrefutable. Nobody can argue against that. All right, so the prayer offered in faith is what James said. He knew enough about the people whom Jesus healed and how often Christ said to people, your faith has healed you, that he knew. That's a component. Did I make that up? No. It's just in the Bible. So don't get mad. And when people get mad at that, why would you get mad at that? Just, you know, accept it. The prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And then the second part of verse 15, and the Lord will raise him up. Wow, that's a double promise. Restore and raise up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. The implication, as we've talked about previously, is that sin can open the door to sickness. And as he goes on, telling us to confess, telling the sick to confess their sins, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. 
the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And there's the, another, the, another connection between healing and righteousness, healing and repentance and obedience. This phrase, the prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much, it's in the context of praying for people who are sick and confessing sins, the people confessing their sins who are sick so that they are healed and raised up. Okay, so that's something that all goes together. And we've talked about that quite, uh, in a, quite enough, I think, already. Okay, so there's the promise. And uh, let's talk now about the prayer of faith, because that's obviously the key ingredient. It's not the oil, it's not the elders. Um, it is the prayer of faith. And uh, many people whom Jesus healed, he didn't anoint them with oil. And he didn't have the elders come. Uh, he said, your faith has healed you. I mean, he didn't, he didn't even credit himself at all, which is amazing, but he, of course, he was the healer, but he, he credited their faith. And so fitting this in the context, you don't have to have elders, you don't have to have oil, but there's got to have to be some faith. Okay. So I, I've observed many times over the years people who were sick and diseased and having the elders come and anoint them with oil, but so oftentimes what I heard prayed was not what I would consider the prayer of faith. Let me explain to you why I didn't consider it the prayer of faith. Because uh, it was a prayer of hope, uh, usually revealed by the cliché. Well, not a cliché, I shouldn't say that, but it is a cliché in a sense when it's used all the time. And that is the prayer that says, Lord, if it's your will. Now, is it God's will, according to these verses, for you to be healed. Well, is any among you sick? Let him call with those church. Well, you know, you will be restored. You will be raised up. The Lord, you know, I mean, it's obvious. It is the Lord's will. So when we tag on that line, if it's your will, here's what we're saying. God, I know you promised to heal me. Uh, you said it in your word. But just in case you are lying about it, let me let you off the hook here. It's really, an, it's really an insult to God, if it be thy will. You should only be praying, if it be thy will, if God's will has not been revealed. But when his will has been revealed, if it be thy will, is an admission that it's not faith. And it's a prayer of hope. You know, well, we sure hope it's God's will. We don't know if it's God's will, but let's just hope it is his will. And, uh, and if it's his will, he'll heal. Well, wait a second. If it's his will, he'll heal. Why are you even praying? Did you stop and think about that? If it's God's will to heal that person, why are you praying? There's no sense in praying. If it's his will, he'll heal him. And if it's not his will, he won't. And your prayer doesn't amount to a hill of beans. You're wasting your time. See, that's why God responds to the prayer of faith, and that's why he expects the prayer of faith out of us, because then praying makes some sense, not this if it be thy will stuff. Okay? So, uh, you know, Paul, or whoever wrote Hebrews, said that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So let us not confuse Faith with hope or hope with faith. There are two different things. Hope is, is hopeful. It's looking for a good outcome, but it's unsure of it. Faith is sure of a good outcome because, you know, it has confidence built upon the word of God and the promise of God. I always encourage people who are sick, who are struggling with their faith, to, you know, then do a thorough Bible study on healing and look at all the people whom Jesus healed, look at all the promises throughout the Bible, you know, bless the Lord, O my soul, David wrote in one of the Psalms, let me not forget any of thy benefits who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases, you know, promises in Proverbs, promises in Exodus, uh, promises, you know, in the epistles and so forth. I mean, there's just a lot to to build our faith. Feed your faith and starve your doubts, okay? And so that could be a, a hindrance to your healing is just lack of faith. And I know people get mad about that. I'll probably get some emails about that. People saying, you know, well, who are you to say this? And I hate you kind of preachers who always talk about, you know, uh, that it depends upon us. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. I made a decision years ago. I'm going to be true to the word no matter what it costs. Okay, I'm not trying to win a popularity contest with people. I'm trying to obey Jesus who died for my sins. Right? So here's another promise, and I've done the best I can to encourage you to act upon it, to make sure you're praying the prayer of faith, but you can't pray in faith unless you're certain it's God's will, and faith only comes from hearing the word of God, so dig into the word, okay? In our next segment together, we're gonna finish the book of James. I'll be right back.
All right, welcome back to the final four verses of uh, James's epistle. And once we're finished this, we're going to go back to the book of Acts and make some more progress in the early church. Uh, right after James had uh, encouraged the Christians to pray for one another that they might be healed of their sicknesses and to confess their sins one to another, he says at the end of verse number 16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So there is a connection between holiness and answered prayer. Remember a few times ago we were in 1 Peter chapter 3 and Peter said, the Lord's ears are open to the prayers of the righteous, but he sets his face against the wicked. And so, you know, the people who have got uh, an unbalanced grace message, you say it doesn't matter how you live, God has no difference in his posture towards you. Uh, that's nonsense according to the, to the Bible, okay? And then James gives an example of a righteous man who had a very effective prayer. Verse number 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I take that to mean he was just a human being. But he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And so what a tremendous example of the, the I hate to say the power of prayer, because there's no power in prayer itself, but the potential uh, uh, that, that, that lies within the prayers of a righteous person. Elijah was a righteous man. He was serving God with all of his heart. He was standing up against opposition. You know, it's clear he loved God with all his heart and it was living it out in his life. And that kind of guy had, you know, an amazing ability to pray. Wow, makes me pause and think. Okay, and uh, so we could elaborate on that, but I want to spend most of my time on the final verse now of James, uh, final two verses, verse number 19 and 20. My brethren, my brethren, my brethren, I'm writing to the church, it's very clear, the whole thing's been to the church, correct? Correct, my brethren. If any among you, ah, he's writing to the church, he says if any among you, within the church, if any among you strays from the truth, okay, so that that's possible, right? People among us in the church who are walking in some degree of truth can stray away from the truth. Now let's keep reading. And one turns him back. So you get hold of him and you say, hey, brother or sister, let me help you out here. You're believing lies. Let me get you back on the way of the truth. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. How can you cover a multitude of sins by getting a sinner who strayed away from the church to, to turn back? You cover a multitude of sins because the sins he committed as he was straying, during that straying time, as he comes back, he repents and God forgives him of those sins and doesn't hold them against him any longer. Had he not turned back, when he went to judgment, God would hold those sins against him, and he'd be judged according to his deeds, you know, not getting the blessing of having his sins erased and wiped away. This is Gospel Christianity 101, okay? Now, here's what I want to point out. The danger of the one among us who strays from the truth, indicating that he was in the truth, he was among us one time, he was in the church, strays from the truth, goes back to a life of sin, returns you know, to the error of his former ways, if you can get him to repent and come back, you will do two things. You will not only cover a multitude of his sins, ultimately, but listen to this in verse 20, save his soul from death. So you know, for those of, us, those of us that just love the Bible and aren't trying to always figure out a way to make it conform to our preconceived ideas of what we want to believe, that's no trouble. That fits in with so many other verses in the Bible that make it very clear that People who are born again can, as free moral agents, determine to go back into darkness, go back into the world, go back into sin, and if their hearts turn against God, they, they, they ultimately will experience what James said they'd experience. Their, they will experience death, not physical death, because everybody experiences that, but save his soul from death. That's 
can only be spiritual death, as sometimes the theologians call it, or and or the second death being cast into the lake of fire. If we had the time, and we don't, we could look at scripture after scripture after scripture that basically says the same thing. Look, in Colossians 1 and verse number 22, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. There's the good news we all love to hear, but look at the condition that Paul places upon it in Colossians 1 and verse 23, the next verse. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So that means it's possible for people to whom Paul was writing to not continue in the faith. And therefore, they had no guarantee that they would be confirmed, uh, presented blameless before God, you know, and holy and blameless before God when they stood before him. You got it? You got it, okay? And isn't it interesting that that's the last thing James warns of in his epistle? It's the last words that he says. Um, and, and why? Well, because he's been, uh, he's been, he says some very sharp and, uh, you know, biting words, really to the point, in your face type admonitions and exhortations and, and, and corrections to people within the church at that time who were in danger of judgment. We've read that as well, temporal judgment. And now there's the ultimate warning at the end. You can save, you know, he's trying to save people from eternal judgment, the death of their souls. Remember Jesus warned, don't fear those who can just kill the body. Fear him who after he is killed can destroy both body and soul. That's the word he used in hell. Okay. All right. I've loved being with you in the book of James. I'm going to love going back with you now to the book of Acts next time. Don't miss it. See you next time. Visit us online at heavenward.tv to view this and every episode of Heavenward TV for free. Watch the behind the scenes videos Read other teaching articles, books, and devotionals written by David Servant. And learn about other exciting ministries that David directs. All this and more is at heavenward.tv.